Okay, um, thanks very much, Robbie. Um, we've got what I think is an exciting session for this morning on creating and translating evidence during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we've got a great panel starting off with Ed Mills. Ed is the principal investigator of one of the COVID trials, the TOGETHER trial. He's the principal scientist at CITEL, clinical trials advisor for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and uh, a part-time professor at HEI who has just been promoted to the full professor rank. He's going to talk about how COVID-19 has fundamentally changed clinical research. Our second speaker, uh, Eliako, is the, a professor of medicine and head of the Division of General Internal Medicine and Geriatrics and director of the Grade Center at the American University of Beirut, also a part-time professor in HDI. And his topic is going to be COVID-19, the ultimate stress test for the guideline development enterprise. Our third speaker, uh, Anne Hayes, is the Director of Research Analysis and Evaluation Branch at the Ontario Ministries of Health and Long-Term Care, and is going to tell us about how, in her experience, um, the uh, government uses evidence regarding COVID-19 to formulate health policy. Each of our speakers are going to talk for approximately 10 minutes, uh, and then the uh, floor will be open to questions, uh, comments, and anything uh, anybody uh, wants to say. So over to you, Ed. Great. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, Gordon and Robbie. Robbie, thanks for organizing this. I'm going to share a few slides that I've got with you. And uh, my intention is to talk about things in the context of just the clinical trials landscape. And then I'm hoping that the other speakers can uh, illustrate the, the, the sequence that goes from uh, evidence generation all the way into making difficult decisions. So uh, I'm going to share my slide. Okay, so this slide is about a paper that, uh, or this presentation will draw on a paper that has come out this week in Lancet Global Health. Uh, we had a series in there about clinical trials that we started pre-pandemic, and uh, the final paper in the, the series addresses that all the ideas that we had pre-pandemic, um, in the end, uh, have changed considerably uh, as a result of the pandemic. And we have referred to that as how COVID-19 has fundamentally changed clinical research. The, the series is in global health, but it, I think it reflects uh, all aspects of, uh, of clinical research. And I think one of the main things is the, the editors put out some social media um, statements saying the COVID-19 pandemic will become a historical turning point that leads to better coordination and collaboration within the medical research community but this outcome will first require buy-in from funders and global health researchers. And I'm hoping I can convince you that that is going to be a major turning point. Um, you know, no doubt you're all aware COVID has resulted in the mobilization of many medical researchers and health workers. Um, initially, there was unprecedented collaboration, but I think that that has largely fizzled out as more and more collaboration uh, would be more rare now than the norm. I think people have gotten tired and some examples that I'll illustrate about where uh, the medical community or medical research community has probably become exasperated with uh, some of the decision making. I think that there's been important lessons to learn from the clinical and trial environment around COVID. And these are predominantly about how we need to improve the speed and conduct of clinical trials, even post pandemic. Um, in general, the challenges are going to be less methodological than they are administrative. So in Canada, for example, and elsewhere, funding for clinical trials was slow to fund established groups. And while organizations like CIHR like to promote how speedy they were, their investments in clinical trials have given us nothing really useful at the moment. And the same goes for NIH, Wellcome Trust, Gates Foundation. Uh, during this presentation, I'm going to argue that we have been woefully unprepared for the need to respond to immediate medical questions 
and I'm going to propose a strategy uh, for this pandemic, which is probably with us for a while and future needs. Uh, next slide, please, Barbara. So um, obviously there was great enthusiasm to conduct medical research at the beginning of the pandemic and a lot of enthusiasm and optimism about different interventions that might work. Um, one of the difficulties uh, and new things that occurred during this pandemic is that we had to communicate from our homes. So we weren't able to get together in the beginning of the pandemic, get together and brainstorm. And science does not thrive without discussion. So debate is an absolutely necessary area of uh, conducting good, good uh, medical research. And I will have to admit that pre-pandemic, I was in no way a fan of going to medical conferences or academic conferences. But now that I recognize the need for public forums for debate on research issues. In the absence of debate, you end up with uh, seniority taking hold or connections that seem to be the rule. Uh, funding was limited to groups um, and most organizations had to use internal funding to conduct small trials. This resulted in misguided interventions for COVID, a uh, total misunderstanding of the mechanisms of the disease and an enormous redundancy in clinical research questions. So for example, uh, by mid-year last year, there had been 340 randomized trials registered of hydroxychloroquine for different stages of COVID. And as we all know now, after a few of those trials read out, the optimism for that intervention was importantly reduced. Next slide, please, Roby. Um, this was a clinical trial tracker that we developed at the beginning of the pandemic to just follow trials that registered, trials that enrolled, and, uh, and trials that completed. By the end of 2020, there had been over 2,500 trials registered and about, uh, about half of them had ever reported enrolling patients, but most trials were very small and enrolled less than 100 participants. I think John talked about this uh, yesterday. I didn't catch his presentation, but I, I have no doubt that's what he was referring to. Almost all trials were two-arm trials, which is an efficient, inefficient way to do trials, uh, often placebo uh, control, meaning lots of people going into placebo arms. As of late April uh, this month, only 253 trials have been reported out. So of 2,500, only 10% have actually reported out a year later. A lot of trials over the, a lot of trials and information over the last year has come out in pre-publication servers such as M MedRx uh, that I think people were initially excited on about a year ago as a quick way to um, to communicate different ideas. What we've learned over the last year is actually that there's a lot of fraud and there's a lot of uh, poor knowledge of how to do trials. And in some ways, I think things like consort have uh, made it even more difficult to determine when something is properly uh, done as a clinical trial, as opposed to, uh, in fact, it was not a randomized trial, but people are using checklists and then reporting them uh, in these pre-publication services if they're randomized trials, when in fact they may not be. I think it should come as no surprise that the best available evidence came from established groups, and in particular, uh, those groups that have been building infrastructure um, prior to the pandemic, and uh, some other groups that have been building infrastructure throughout this entire period uh, of the pandemic. I think that, uh, the majority of trials have only recruited a small number of the patients that they ever intended on recruiting, let's say 10%. <coughs> Excuse me. And then I think it's reasonable to ask, okay, for all of these trials that have recruited, let's say 10% of their populations, what are we going to do with the data that has been collected? Um, there are some initiatives where they say, well, let's build individual patient data meta-analyses, for example. And uh, you know, Wellcome Trust is leading one of them. They call it the Workbench. Gates Foundation, the same thing. There's also Vivly. But to be honest with you, I think that this has exposed how poor many clinical trials are. And even though you have a plethora of unfinished trials and uh, a, a, a large number of patients who, got, who did their best, they uh, volunteered their time and indeed their health, uh, and potentially life into a clinical trial. Whether or not these trials can ever provide usable information is debatable. <clears throat> to me, I think in general, you probably cannot use most of these trials. And uh, I think this also then exposes 
if we end up with so many clinical trials that are either partially done and unusable or completed and unusable, uh, but resemble what a good clinical trial might look like because they have uh, found strategies such as using consort checklist uh, to kind of improve the way that a poor quality clinical trial uh, can, can be better reported. Uh, I think that the long-term, the, the next stage uh, ramifications of this are important. So people who are doing systematic review on a particular topic may not pick up on some of the uh, inefficiencies of the core trials. And uh, as a result, you end up with, uh, you know, poorly done, uh, poorly interpretable secondary evidence. Um, so in general, this poor quality research, I think, is a disservice to colleagues, to the patients and the public. And all of this results in a, a lot of waste. And there's been a lot written about waste over the years um, in terms of uh, wasted resources, wasted uh, um, money, for example, uh, wasted labor. But one of the things I think is most important in medical research is wasted hope among patients and the public. And uh, people are becoming exasperated with the medical community at the moment. And to a certain extent, they're right to have done that um, because I think that they were promised a lot at the beginning of this pandemic in terms of solutions. And here we are a year later, and really it's only a few things that, that uh, appear to work. Next slide, please, Robbie. Uh, having said all of that, I think we have a, a really a good opportunity for a learning um, change in the way that we do clinical research. What we need are smarter investments in clinical research. And I think that when the story is written about clinical trials in COVID, uh, the topic that we are going to find has given us the most useful information is going to be uh, the adoption of platform trials and um, master protocols. Platform trials are trials that allow you to evaluate more than one intervention at any particular time. So multiple, multiple drugs, for example, or ideally it should have been multiple um, vaccines, but that didn't occur uh, when they were evaluating the, the vaccines in what they refer to as a master protocol. A master protocol is an overarching protocol that should, that all clinical trials with, uh, asking a similar question should try to fit in terms of populations, interventions, uh, outcomes, things like that. Um, the slide that you've got in front of you, you may not be familiar with this term platform trials, but some of you will be uh, because over the last year, the, the WHO solidarity trial and more importantly, the UK trials, for example, the recovery or the principal trials resemble this design. You have multiple interventions, you do an interim analysis, you can drop an arm, drop an intervention or add one if you choose. Platform trials evaluate multiple interventions at any time and can drop uh, or add interventions and this saves, saves time and uh, saves futility. I think the remap cap trial historically is going to go down as one of the most important trials, perhaps even in history, uh, because that was a platform trial looking at pre-pandemic pre, pre planned platform trial uh, that looked at strategies for community acquired pneumonia but they somehow had the foresight to build in an appendix into their ethics approval. And so it was pre-approved to write um, an appendix for an influenza-like disease should a pandemic occur. And I think going forward, perhaps large, uh, large trials should now have a worst case scenario opportunity built into them. And ideally these platform trials should be perpetual in nature. Hence, I'm going to consistently argue for building infrastructure and longer term investment. It, you know, as a Canadian, I think it's a shame that uh, we had CIHR launch competitions when we have organizations like, uh, you know, Population Health Research Institute who were ready to go with massive trials around the world, but they had to compete with people who had no infrastructure whatsoever. And if so, you could finish up in the next minute or so, that yep. would be great. Let's do it. Last slide, please. Uh, here are a few of these um, uh, platform trials that you might be familiar with. Uh, the trial that I run is the TOGETHER trial in South Africa and Brazil. Um, in conclusion, I would say, look, it, who has given us really use, useful information at the end of this? Probably the UK has. And why is that? Uh, they, were, they had already developed the national network of clinical trial sites via secondary hospitals, so less likely to be academic centers. 
they had a small amount of funding already in place. Their regulatory and ethics committee reacted in days rather than weeks. And in essence, all along they had been building infrastructure and a population and staff that were primed for clinical, uh, uh, clinical trials. We don't have that infrastructure in Canada, although there are now discussions to build it. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Ed. That was just super, really uh, great perspective. Um, Ellie is now going to talk about the challenges for taking the information that Ed has told us about and turning it into clinical practice guidelines. Uh, thank you, Gordon. Can, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you fine, Ali. Okay, thank you. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be presenting at the research day. Uh, and it's perfect to follow on um, Ed's presentation. Uh, so uh, these are my disclosures uh, in terms of my presentation. Uh, so, so let me jump into the issue of the evidence space before I get to the guidelines. So the evidence space uh, for the guideline development during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we started off with very scarce and practically inexistent evidence. So that was a major challenge. So we had to refer to indirect evidence. However, very quickly, the evidence space grew and uh, it was at a record and unprecedented pace, as you all know, which has become a major challenge. In spite of this, the evidence space remained suboptimal. First, in terms of the certainty of the evidence. Uh, so uh, one example we could refer to is the BMJ uh, Living Systematic Review and Network Meta-Analysis. And if you look at the uh, latest edition that came out in uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think the evidence for most of these comparisons and for most of these outcomes uh, remain either low or very low. Uh, in spite of being uh, more than one year into the pandemic and in spite of the huge number of uh, patients that could have been recruited and also the trials that have been conducted, uh, as Ed mentioned. Um, however, the other challenge with the evidence space has been the re reliability of the data. Uh, if you think about the certainty of the evidence as a, a guideline community, we have come to, uh, we have developed the methods and the frameworks to deal with it, like the great framework, where we could still develop recommendation uh, when we have low or very low certainty evidence. However, what we are not prepared to deal with, we haven't been prepared to deal with, is the reliability or the lack of reliability of data. So you're all familiar with the uh, torrent of preprints with the numbers uh, going up at an exponential rate since the start of the pandemic, uh, the retractions of papers from major journals, uh, papers that had reported on studies that supposedly that were uh, groundbreaking, and the hype of the uh, press releases. So I can tell you this has been a major challenge. Uh, studies uh, declaring major results but for which we only had press releases. Uh, the, the, the context also included the infodemic. I thought this was an interesting study. It's, it found that Trump uh, would be the single largest driver of coronavirus misinformation. So keep that in mind because guideline developers are not uh, working in a vacuum. Uh, the, the other uh, challenge was the politicization of decision-making where uh, you could see from the head headlines, um, many of the uh, decisions, many of the opinions, the statements were driven by uh, political uh, opinions. And I can tell you, I, I, that's my feeling, I haven't seen any study about this, uh, but my perception is that this has trickled into the guideline development process and affected it. So uh, I call this the stress test because we are dealing with an evidence base that is challenging. Uh, decision makers who have heightened expectations, they wanted information and guidance as of yesterday and the infodemic and the politicization of the decision-making process. So that's the stress test. So how did the uh, guideline community react? Uh, so first uh, to deal with the decision-making, uh, having pressing need for guidance, uh, people referred or uh, used the rapid guidelines methodology. And as more and more data was being generated, 
and the evidence base was changing. We moved rapidly from the concept of rapid guideline, we built on them to develop the living guidelines. Uh, in addition, we took advantage of adv advanced methods and systematic reviews that we have been developing uh, the systematic review community uh, for years now. So the rapid and the living in terms of systematic reviews, network meta-analyses, the use of artificial intelligence, crowdsourcing, evidence map, etc. So all this has been in the works for years, and it, it was a good uh, timing to use all of these to respond to the pandemic. The other advantages or the other ways that the guideline uh, development community reacted in a positive way was um, better consideration of indirect evidence, especially at the beginning of the uh, pandemic. Uh, the consideration of contextual factors, which became more and more important, particularly for public health kind of uh, recommendations. For example, I think about the uh, PPEs, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic and the shortages and how the recommendations were shaped by those. Even now with the uh, vaccination, who is being uh, prioritized based on what factors, et cetera, all this is playing into the uh, decision-making process. We also have the concept of recommendation maps that has emerged very strongly uh, and the use of online meeting technology, which I should say has been uh, great uh, for the, uh, in many aspects, uh, obviously it has its shortcomings, but in terms of allowing more frequent interactions between the systematic review teams and the panels, which was uh, a bit challenging in the past. Some of the shortcomings, uh, first, the rapidity of development may have come at the cost of quality, and there's already emerging evidence that the quality of uh, many of the guidelines developed during the pandemic, particularly under the rapid mode, uh, is suboptimal. Uh, the other thing is the rapid and the living fatigue. Uh, people just got tired of you know, working on rapid reviews, working on rapid guidelines, and then maintaining them in a living mode. There's a big question about sustainability, uh, not to mention the duplication of work. So. We have few studies that are feeding into the guidelines, and these studies have been summarized again and again and again in huge in a huge number of systematic reviews. So this is this has been a, a unique case of research waste. However, what the main shortcoming is, I think, is the lack of collaboration or even coordination between the different actors. So by actors, I mean the patients and the public on one hand, the trial community, the evidence synthesis community, the guideline development community, and the knowledge translation community. A simple example is when, if you are a part or, or developing a living guideline where you are uh, ready to go with any new evidence, and then there's a press release about a new trial with groundbreaking results, all what you have is the hype of the press release. It's really hard to move forward. You communicate with the trial. It's very hard to get any data. They take forever to publish the results after they have published their press release, and then everything is delayed. In terms of the guideline development, you do all your best uh, to meet deadlines, develop or update your recommendations within uh, days or weeks, and then it takes months, one or two months for the uh, for the journal, for example, to publish uh, the results or the update of your recommendations, which is also a major problem. So you could see that there is all these groups, everyone working very hard, working in a rapid mode, living mode, etc. But then there's this disconnect. People are working in silos, and this has definitely affected the outcome, uh, the, the desired outcome. So what we need is a new paradigm for developing guidance in the uh, post-COVID-19 era. Uh, so actors and stakeholders should aim to have a common goal, uh, conceive an overarching process, and adopt a shared set of principles. So in terms of the com common goal, I think the common goal should be to answer the questions of decision makers, as opposed to the disconnected goals of the different actors. So now trialists, they work hard, they get their uh, trials going, and their main goal practically, practically, I would say, is to, to publish the results. And then for them, that's done. 
And then it's up to the systematic review. Now it's the turn of the systematic reviewers to struggle, and then for the develop for the guideline developers to struggle, and then to the publication. You see that there is not a common goal. And if everyone has the same goal that as a, for example, as a trialist, my ultimate goal, I can claim success only if I get to answering the, the answer, the, to answer the question of the decision maker, this is when uh, the system would work. Maybe if you so, could finish up in the next minute, please. Yes, so this should be used for all actors at the yardstick uh, to measure success, establish incentive rewards and funding scheme. In terms of the overarching process, this should, make sure that everyone has uh, processes that are in line and integrated, uh, like prioritization of questions, the evidence mapping, reducing duplication of efforts. And the shared set of principles are already there. So health research should be a public good and not my own data to publish uh, as, I, as I want. There should be a fair system of credit, increasing transparency and shared governance. So we've been, uh, we've heard a lot that the pandemic is, is not a sprint, it's a marathon. I would say it has to be a relay. People have to work together to get to the end. So this is my last slide. This is the, my a report card for the stress test for the guideline development enterprise. I would say there are lots of, lots of achievements on many fronts that we should be uh, proud of. However, there are many shortcomings that require more than just a conservative management approach. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ali, about uh, summarizing the stress test and the responses. Um, excellent. Uh, and now, Anne is going to tell us about how all this information gets used in the decision-making process uh, at the level of Ministries of Health in Canada. Uh, Anne. Thanks, Gordon. And, and I, I actually have been uh, really interested listening to the two presentations prior to mine and and I think uh, there's there's a lot of common themes in in what we're talking about but I'm going to give you a perspective from the Ministry of Health and and from uh, how evidence uh, you know gets uh, directly into policy so um, you can go to the next slide <clears throat> Robbie thanks on December 31st, 2019, the ministry was first notified of several cases of viral pneumonia of unknown origin in Wuhan, China. As a novel coronavirus, there were many uncertainties. The key challenges we faced in the early response was imprecise information and a rapidly evolving base of evidence. How the virus was being transmitted, the best infection measures, the various ways the virus could manifest, who could get sick, who was likely to die, who might be asymptomatic were among the many unknowns facing us. Next slide. As the magnitude and severity of the pandemic grew, governments had to take actions quickly. So the pace of policy development across government started to accelerate significantly. A policy development cycle used to take weeks and months now needed to happen in days and hours. This was made more challenging by the lack of scientific evidence on many aspects of the pandemic, noted by my, my uh, co-panelists here. Across government and the health sector, leaders have needed to make decisions on many issues where the scientific evidence is not yet available or conclusive. Next slide. With this accelerated pace of policy development also came an acceleration in evidence generation, synthesis and uptake. The pandemic has underscored the importance of collaboration between public health and the broader healthcare system and between the ministry and our many partners, including experts and academics from a wide range of disciplines. We've responded collectively with an emphasis on speed, efficiency and effectiveness We've developed an approach to bringing translated evidence to ministry knowledge users in a way that directly speaks to their needs. Successes in our early response included an ability to obtain rapid cycle scientific input and insert that into the advice and recommendations issued to the health sector, stakeholders and partner ministries 
as well as using it to inform the actions the government was taking. The active response of our technical tables to the ever-changing landscape has been crucial in their analysis of benchmarks for modeling and other jurisdictions to the translation of expert opinions on all manner of issues related to the response. There's also been significant investment in research at the federal and provincial levels that needs to be translated into policy quickly. Among these investments, the, part, the ministry has partnered with CIHR on COVID-19 mental health and addictions funding. And we've also joined the Ontario Ministry of Colleges and Universities on their research call resulting in eight projects, all of high priority to ministry knowledge users. Next slide, please. One of the first things we did was to develop the COVID-19 research priorities framework. This was done in consultation with Public Health Ontario, Ontario Health, the ministry and other experts. It sought to focus the collective effort by defining the research areas and questions. We've used the framework in a variety of ways, including to help adjudicate the relevance of proposals as part of the Ministry of Colleges and Universities COVID-19 research funding rounds. Next slide, please. Early on in the pandemic, we realized that groups with technical expertise were facing the same pressures, all working on the same issues and with complementary strengths. In order to push through this period of ambiguity, we realized that we had to work together to respond together actively and proactively whenever possible. We realized that pooling our resources would lead to better results, so we got organized and now have a number of groups volunteering their expertise in technical areas and working together to share information and reduce duplication of effort across organizations. These groups came together to form three separate technical tables, one for modeling the course and other aspects of the pandemic, one for collecting, synthesizing and disseminating evidence, and more recently, one for advising on the behavioral aspects of the pandemic. There are also other more informal tables as well. I co-chair the Evidence Synthesis Network, which is comprised of groups specializing in evidence synthesis and knowledge translation, including the McMaster Health Forum and COVID End and the Cochrane Collaboration, both based at McMaster University. The network has committed to provide their expertise to create high quality, relevant and timely synthesized research evidence to inform decision makers. We have a website where you can access all of our products. These uh, three tables work closely with the science advisory table where the research community analyzes and deliberates based on the evidence to provide clear scientific briefs that feed directly into decision making and are available to the public. There's a website where you can see all these published materials. These summaries are then provided to the health coordination table, which is an advisory and oversight body providing executive leadership coordination and alignment to drive problem solving across the health system response. The health coordination table was established by the Minister of Health and reports to the joint ministers pandemic leadership table. The provincial response structure and the health coordination table membership have evolved over time to be responsive to the pandemic's tra trajectory. Shifting its focus from emergency response and, re and outbreak management to stabilization, recovery and preparedness for future ways of the pandemic. Current membership includes representation from Public Health Ontario, interministerial partners, including the Ministry of Long-Term Care, and external health system experts from hospitals, universities, uh, and other system partners. Next slide, please. We've significantly changed the way we do our evidence synthesis work. The pandemic really changed how we were packaging information, which led us to create a new style of product. The evidence synthesis briefing note speaks more directly to busy decision makers who need the evidence quickly broken down and readily usable. 
We used to take weeks or even months to produce evidence synthesis products. Now our average turnaround is less than a week. In jurisdictional scanning also has become a much bigger part of our synthesis work. Often we get requests for topics that simply have no scientific evidence yet. So we turn to what others have been doing and what is their experience. The evidence updates is a weekly product. Uh, we just published issue 55. This product has taken us far and wide into the health system. And although a simple product, it's been a revelation in terms of the demand from across the system. We've realized that there are still many parts of the health system that don't have access to curated evidence on a regular basis. Our products are all available on our website. We have a Ministry of Health Research Branch website, and we also have an Evidence Synthesis Network website. The Evidence Synthesis Network website is affiliated with the Science Advisory Table website. Next slide, please. We're also supporting health data infrastructure through ICS and the Ontario Health Data Platform to meet the critical data evidence and evaluation, evaluation needs of the health sector in Ontario. We launched the OHDP on July 15th, 2020, which included a handful of early projects on the ICS platform and the launch of a website on OHDP. Both ICS and the Queen's platforms are fully operational now. ICS has a COVID dashboard where they routinely publish results of research and analytics. Right now, they're pushing out data on vaccine coverage across the province. The platform is especially well-placed to enable vaccine studies, but many other types of research. The objectives of the data platform are to empower a broader community of researchers to have access to more data to better understand COVID-19 trends, to support and recovery. You, and we'll yep. finish up in the next minute, please. Yep, okay. Uh, uh, the application to access the data is on the OHDP website. Next slide and final slide. Um, the COVID-19 Challenge Question Initiative is, is another new initiative. Launched in September 22, it's based on an integrated knowledge translation approach designed to accelerate the translation of research results into evidence that can be taken up by ministry knowledge users. Starting with the research priorities framework through multiple rounds of consultation, this work evolved to become a more defined set of challenge questions reflecting those issues the ministry really needed answers to. Directly linked to the launch of the data platform, the challenge question initiatives helps ensure that researchers accessing the platform address high priority questions responsive to the needs of government. We have about 30 challenge question projects active at the moment where researchers are working directly with knowledge users to deliver impact. So as you can see, COVID-19 has changed how we do our evidence work. We've had opportunities to tighten the link between evidence and policy and to have meaningful impact on decision-making. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Anne. Uh, we have about 19 minutes left. Um, the, we would welcome at this point any comments that the pan, that you can make, not necessarily directed at the panelists, but to which the panelists could respond. Questions for the panel in general, uh, or uh, questions for a specific panelist. Um, I would encourage you, once Robbie gives you the word, to uh, unmute yourself and to uh, turn your video on and ask your question or make your comment. But it's gonna start, I believe, with your sending uh, chats to uh, uh, chat questions or comments to Robbie. Anything yet, Robbie? No questions yet, uh, Gordon. So uh, okay, perhaps- so I, I will start. Yeah. Um, and uh, a very short time ago, we had the Premier of Ontario, our tough guy Premier, weeping in public about his mistakes and apologizing. One might have characterized that as a failure 
of the process of getting evidence into policy. Could you comment? Um, so yes, there's been a lot of uh, talk about that chapter in the process. I would say two things. I would say that the science advisory table and all the technical supports that are associated with it have actually had unprecedented access to the policy decision-making process throughout the, the pandemic and have had a very positive uh, impact on decision-making. The reality though, is that the, the political decision-making policy ultimately is a political decision. And so, um, what I think we have seen is that the evidence inputs are not the only thing that a government considers in its decision making. And so there are other factors, there are other interests, there are other uh, sort of issues that the government is weighing up. As public servants, we are accustomed to this relationship where we give our frank and fearless advice and we know that it isn't always taken up. I think with COVID and the unprecedented access that the science table and, and uh, has had in the policy process, it's been uh, disappointing when the government doesn't take 100% of the advice. So, you know, I wouldn't describe it as a failure. I would say overall, um, science has had a much bigger influence in the political decision-making process than in, in the past, but the government is weighing up a lot of competing interests. And so at times they make decisions that scientists may not agree with, but are based on political uh, considerations at play. It's it's all part of the process. Uh, thanks, Anne. Robbie, do we have questions or comments yet? Uh, Lahana is raising his hand. So Lahana, please go ahead. Can you unmute? Wait, I'll ask you to unmute. Should yeah, be good ideally, now. folks will unmute and show their video when they're making their questions and comments. Lahana, can you speak? Cannot hear you. Can't hear you or see you, Lahana. <laughs> uh, what if you type your question in the chat, Lahana, and then uh, I'll ask it. Um, in the Ellie, meantime, I wanted uh, to say something. Ellie just put up his hand, I saw. Uh, do okay. you want to say something while we're waiting, Ellie? Uh, yes, so maybe follow up on uh, the question to Anne. I think the, 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 the issue of policymaking got a bit more complicated with COVID-19 because the, uh, the outcomes are not just health outcomes. You're talking about education, you're talking about economy, financial implications, etc. And I think each, uh, you know, there are different sides and everyone is valuing the outcomes that they care about, whether it's health or economy or education, et cetera. And I think this is what the next chapter in decision-making is about, is not just to focus on one sector, but also to see how we could bring these, the outcomes relevant to the different sectors to get sector together into the decision-making process. Uh, thanks, Ellie. Um, how are our technical problems and our questions and comments coming along, Robbie? I see Alfonso has his hand raised. So uh, Alfonso, go ahead. Uh, yeah, well, thank you everyone for, for excellent presentation and insight. Um, I wanted a, a comment, uh, maybe a quick comment from uh, Ed, if possible. Uh, he, he said, uh, you know, we don't really need new methods. We need, we need infrastructure. And I tend to agree, and uh, you know, he showed very compelling data. Others were shown yesterday by uh, by John. Um, is this infrastructure really working without changing also the culture of the research community? Is there a different way of uh, uh, being 
you know, uh, dealing with the data, owning the data, sharing data, and so on, or is just a technical matter of infrastructure? Thank you very much for the question, Alfonso. And uh, I'm not sure if I particularly have the answer, um, except to say, you know, when I think about this in the context of clinical trials in a global context, um, and uh, either pre-pandemic or during the pandemic, the places that were most ready to respond historically uh, and now have been the places that have a long history of conducting research. And uh, it, some places they're building that as we speak, some places are not. Uh, as I mentioned to you, the PHRI would have been a great example in Canada of the best infrastructure for clinical trials in Canada, ready to go. They had proposals ready to go, and yet they had to compete with everybody else in the country who didn't have any infrastructure whatsoever. And I don't even think PHRI did well on those competitions. Um, which is unfortunate because it's a whole entirely random process. So I've been working with the Gates Foundation for the last five years. I have been trying to pitch this idea of perpetual clinical trials. So even when a question has been answered, we keep the infrastructure so that we're ready to launch right into future questions. I must be honest, funders in particular don't want to think beyond short periods of time uh, answering one clinical question. And then they think, uh, you know, if you say, look, if we successfully answer a very complicated one question, we should have other questions ready to go because we've already trained those staff and primed the communities and have all the infrastructure in place. But I have I have seen very few examples where funders, uh, which seems to be the major impediment, uh, funders want to go in, involved in, and do a 10 year investment or 20 year investment, something like that. There are a few examples from pediatrics and from cancer where you might see that. Uh, but I think that this needs to become the new form of, uh, of funding. Having said all of that, uh, some organizations are much more savvy about acquiring funding than others. And what we don't want to see is that this all gets dominated by the big universities. Uh, it needs to be driven, of course, by the innovation uh, and the, the places that maybe have uh, endemic diseases. So um, all of that's to say it's a debate and, and uh, we need forums for debate on that. So oh, just with respect, with respect to that infrastructure, people, I think people should be aware of what's happened in Britain. So about a decade ago, the British government decided that the, it is a responsibility of the people de developing clinical care to, de to participate in research, um, and they put some money behind it. They created an infrastructure for clinical trials throughout the whole country, funded with um, research personnel on the ground throughout community hospitals. Um, and many of us would look at it as a spectacular success. And that is uh, why recovery um, did so well, because they had the whole infrastructure in the community hospitals ready to go, and they were able to launch right in. And uh, some of us think um, uh, Francois Lamontagne has led us in publishing a recent article in the CMAJ saying that's the sort of thing that we need in Canada. And uh, I think that's the, that's the one biggest success where the, the most, perhaps the most important funder, which is the government has insisted that part of clinical care is participating in research and then provided the resources to make it happen. So if any of you, feel like pushing our government in that direction. Uh, some of us think that that would be very positive. Robbie, who would like to comment or uh, um, ask a question? Thanks, or, Gordon. Alfonso, did you want to say something more? I think I might have cut you off. No, no, I, I wanted to say exactly what you said, Gordon. I, I think that uh, we, we might need to start thinking not necessarily as a transfer of transfer of fund to support research, but as a research partnership where, you know, I understand the hesitancy of the funder of funding long term, it would be different. And there are examples where yeah, it is a partnership more than a transfer of fund. <laughs> Robbie, who would like to comment or speak? speak? Yeah, unfortunately, we couldn't hear Lahana, but he has uh, provided the question here. So I'll relay it. Uh, this is for Anne. Um, Lana is asking, what is the role of the uh, National Advisory Committee on Immunization, NASI, in the science table? Well, 
I mean, formally, there's no uh, there's no formal relationship. There are uh, a number of members of the the immunization table that are uh, based at Public Health Ontario, and those same people att attend science advisory table meetings. So I would say that there is um, a cross fertilization between those tables, but there's no formal relationship. The, the NASI table is a very formal table. So they, the, there are uh, protocols and, and, and processes that they follow very strictly. So usually those members are not able to, uh, they don't share work in you know, progress or decision-making in progress. So there are limits to what you can, how you can collaborate with that table because it is very formal and, and very structured and uh, for obvious reasons. Robbie. Thank you, Anne. Any folks here? Yeah, so there's uh, uh, two more comments here. So perhaps, uh, Kevin, if you want to perhaps ask your question, I'll unmute you, see if this works. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, Gordon, I, I really do appreciate what the UK has done and believe in it as well. However, I also do recognize that there are many community physicians or independent um, physicians in, um, who are all already actively recruiting and participating in clinical trials by pharmaceutical companies who often pay better um, than what the government may be able to do or may be able to incentivize. So how do we um, compete with that? Uh, any of our panelists want to comment on that? Uh, I can have a comment because I do a lot of work with contract research organizations. And uh, they're the ones who do the trials, right? So we talk about pharma doing trials. Actually, pharma doesn't do trials. They bring in contract research organizations that actually do have this established network. So the CROs are one step ahead of what we do outside of the private world. They have their networks. They have their infrastructure, which explains why they were able to move so quickly into vaccines and give us effective vaccine information. Um, Kevin, you're absolutely right. Having said that, in this circumstance, uh, CROs did a very shoddy job or were unsuccessful at recruiting patients in general in uh, North America and, and in the West uh, because the, over the last year, the epidemic tended to be changing and the participation of people changed quite a bit. Um, so they got their best results in, in places where uh, physicians are less likely to be competing for, for paid patients, for example. Uh, but you bring up a very good topic and, and one I think that, uh, again, we need to debate in a forum where people are allowed to disagree. Um, one answer and uh, my familiarity with the UK model is, I must acknowledge, superficial. But when the government says, OK, folks, we funded this, we say it's a priority, we've given all of this, your, this money to set up an infrastructure, it's an extremely powerful incentive for people to say, okay, government has said this is a priority. They provided us with the money for the infrastructure. We'd better all sign in and get going. And, and it's worked. Right. Thank you, Ed and Gordon. Um, I believe Alfonso, you have another question to follow up. Yes, Robbie, thank you. Um, uh, this is for Ellie. Uh, Ellie, is there any comment you can make on any learning uh, from the preprints in terms of uh, um, publication bias or uh, uh, negative trials? Or is there any, I understand all, all the noise that those generate. Is there any positive uh, aspect that we can think of? I think I'm so. Um, so I'm, I'm not aware of any, uh, you know, formal study assessing uh, preprints. Uh, definitely, what uh, preprints have induced is for the uh, peer-reviewed journals to have more efficient processes and try to publish the papers that they get. So that's definitely uh, a plus. 
uh, and then you know offering the data early enough to have a peek uh, and have a, an idea about where the, the direction of the evidence is. Uh, however, uh, unfortunately, I can tell you from the experience with two different panels, uh, both of them were a bit hesitant and resistant to moving forward with update recommendation simply based on preprints because of the lack of peer review. Um, and I think this is a sign that a P, uh, the preprints have not established trust yet uh, in terms of being used for formal guideline development processes. We're getting near the end. Have you got somebody who would like to speak or ask a question, Robbie? And no more questions here on the platform, Gordon, but perhaps uh, we can give okay, the well, I can, I just uh, We're getting very near the end, but maybe I can make one other uh, closing comment or reflection uh, in terms of um, uh, where organizations can help with the cooperation. So uh, uh, our group works very closely with the World Health Organization for their COVID um, uh, pharmaceutical drug and uh, uh, immune uh, guidelines. And they have managed to pull together the trialists to cooperate uh, and uh, allow access uh, to their data, uh, some of which is not out there at all, some of which is in preprints, which has really facilitated um, the definitive systematic reviews uh, uh, that are then fed into the WHO guidelines. So um, that is, so if somebody has the moral authority to get people to cooperate um, and, uh, and the journals have been very good too. So the, uh, in, in a couple of instances, the latest, uh, which we're just doing with the IL-6 inhibitors, uh, Jan is going to publish the systematic review. All the all the WHO has got all the um, uh, all the trialists uh, to participate together. So there is some hope of coordination. Um, that represents one example of hope of coordination and getting uh, definitive evidence summaries and guidelines uh, uh, created as quickly as possible. So um, thanks to everybody. Um, our panelists have been superb, I think. Um, and so it's been a great session. Thanks, Robbie, to you and your co-organizers for putting this together, uh, choosing a great panel. And thank you for allowing me the privilege of, uh, of uh, chairing the session. Thanks very much.